Hi, I'm Nicholas from Readings.com. Today we'll be doing a review of the popular TCL QM8. Ever since we published this review on our website, there's been a ton of discussions about it, and I'm sure many of you are still curious to see how it performs. It's TCL's new flagship TV in 2023, and it's their only release this year to feature mini-LED backlighting. It sits above other Q-series TVs, the Q7 and the Q6, and it's available in different sizes from 65 to 98 inches. We tested the 65 inch size and the results are also valid for all the other models. It's also important to note that the QM8 is currently only available in North America. In Europe, there's the TCL C845, but that's a different TV and we don't know how it performs because we only buy TVs available in the US. You'll probably notice this neat little crack in the top right corner. Our unit did arrive damaged, but this doesn't impact any of the test results. The first thing we'll look at is the design. It has a simple look, thin bezels, and a center mounted stand. You can change the TV's height, which is nice if you want to place a soundbar in front without blocking the screen. The stand itself is metal, while everything else is plastic. The screen doesn't wobble either. And overall, the TV feels well made, but clearly it's not immune to shipping damage. Looking at the back of the TV, you almost feel like they took inspiration from Mike Wazowski and Monsters Inc. with a subwoofer right in the center. The inputs are on the left side with power on the right side and they each have panel covers. However, the TV doesn't offer much cable management, so it'll just be dangling off the sides. If you need completely tidy cables so your guests don't judge you, you'll have to buy cable clips or sleeves. They can judge your gravy though, but not the cable management. While we're on the topic of inputs, let's see what it's got. It has four HDMI ports, with the first two supporting HDMI 2.1 bandwidth, and the last one serves as the ER port for audio pass-through. You can use it with both DTS and Dolby Atmos audio formats. It's nice to have the ER port different from the HDMI 2.1 ports, so you don't lose one of these high-end bandwidth slots to a soundbar or receiver. Unfortunately, unlike some other high-end TVs, its tuner only supports ATSC 1.0, so you can't get over-the-air 4K channels. The first thing you see when you turn it on is the Google TV interface. It's pretty easy to use, and navigating through the menus is quick and snappy. There are many apps you can download, but like any Google TV, there are ads throughout the interface that you can't turn off. The remote is large, yet doesn't have a numpad. It has shortcut buttons to popular streaming services and a mic you could use with Google Assistant. You could ask it to change inputs and search apps, for example. There's even a mic built into the TV that you could use for hands-free voice control by saying the magic words. One cool thing about this remote is that it has motion-activated backlighting, so you can see the buttons easier in the dark. Now that everything is set up, let's look at the picture quality. We'll start with the contrast, where this TV excels. With local dimming on, the TV displays deep and inky blacks next to bright highlights in dark rooms. There's some very minor blooming with bright objects on a dark background, but what do you expect? It's not an OLED. That said, the blooming is hard to notice with most content. The local dimming keeps up with fast moving objects well, and you can't tell when an object moves between dimming zones. The 65 inch unit we tested has 1080 dimming zones, and the larger sizes have more zones, so the local dimming on those should be better. This makes it great for watching HDR content, and it gets incredibly bright, enough for small highlights to really stand out. Some small objects can even hit up to 2,000 nits in brightness, or reach an incredible 3,000 nits of brightness in the vivid picture mode. However, it doesn't sustain this for long, and eventually drops back down to 2,000 nits. Still, that's very bright. While having a bright TV in HDR is great, it actually over brightens most content, so it's inaccurate no matter the picture setting. This is pretty disappointing for a flagship TV. Oddly enough, it ignores the HDR metadata in the IMAX mode, so it doesn't accurately show IMAX content. TCL contacted us when we posted the review on our website, and they're looking into the issues with this. At the time of filming, nothing's been fixed yet though. As for color, it displays a wide range of colors in HDR, so images are lifelike and realistic. You need to set the color space setting to native for the best performance though, as leaving it on auto severely undersaturates colors. Luckily, it has fantastic color volume to make colors look bright and vivid, but not all colors are as bright as pure white. One good thing to note is that it supports most common HDR formats, including HDR10+, and Dolby Vision, so you'll get this great performance no matter the format your content is in. Now that we've talked about how it performs in a dark room, Let's switch the light on and see how it performs in a bright room. You won't have any issues using it in a bright room as it easily gets bright enough to fight glare and its reflection handling is fantastic. Large, bright areas do get dimmer because of the TV's automatic brightness limiter, but it isn't a big drop off. Even if you watch content with bright areas that take up the full screen like sports, 
you won't have any issues with visibility. There are a few things to consider that we haven't talked about so far. First, it's important to have good image accuracy in SDR so that images are realistic. The accuracy on this TV is alright, but most of the issues are with the white balance, and even at that, it's not terrible. The color temperature is on the warm side, but besides that, colors are accurate. Gray uniformity is also something to consider if you watch content with large areas of the same color, like a grassy football field. It does have overall good gray uniformity, but there's still dirty screen effect in the center. You might find this distracting with some content, like hockey, or if you use it as a PC monitor, but uniformity can also vary between units. Lastly, the TV has a narrow viewing angle, which is disappointing if you want to use it in a wide seating area. People viewing from the sides will see a washout image, so it's not ideal for watching the big game with a bunch of people. Now that we've discussed how its panel performs, let's find out how it processes images. It uses the AIPQ Engine Gen 3 processor, which TCL advertises to improve the contrast, color, and clarity compared to older processors. Yeah, it's pretty good with the contrast and colors, but not so much with clarity. It loses a lot of detail when upscaling content. This isn't ideal if you want to activate some nostalgia with older DVDs or video games, or even if you want to watch cable TV, as images won't be that sharp. This is something else that TCL mentioned they would look into, but we haven't seen any improvement yet. On the plus side, it does smooth out low quality content well, like when using streaming services that limit quality with compression, like if you're using Netflix or Disney+. Plus. There isn't any macro blocking, but there's still a loss of some fine details. Another thing regarding its processing is that it handles gradients well, which is important for watching HDR content. This means scenes with similar shades don't have too much noticeable banding, but there still is some in darker colors. Okay, now it's time to talk about the fun stuff, the gaming performance. There's a lot to say about this quirky TV. First, it supports 4K and 1440p up to 144Hz, and 1080p up to a crazy 240Hz. However, you need to use HDMI 1 for those signals and have an AMD graphics card because there are issues with high refresh rates with NVIDIA graphics cards. Because HDMI ports 3 and 4 only support HDMI 2.0 bandwidth, you should use HDMI 1 for most devices anyways. It supports all common VRR formats like FreeSync, G-Sync, and HDMI 4 and VRR. It works well with any resolution, but there's some flicker with VRR and local nibbing on at the same time. One odd thing is that there's resolution halving with 1080p at 240Hz, which can be noticeable. It also has low input lag with 120Hz signals for a responsive feel while gaming, but it weirdly increases at higher refresh rates. It isn't enough to severely impact your gaming experience, but it's something to note. Motion handling is where it gets interesting, especially if you use VRR. The response time changes depending on the refresh rate. It's as if it only performs best at 60Hz and 120Hz. Anything that falls in between those has too much overshoot, and the motion handling is worse even with 144 and 240Hz signals, which is pretty unexpected. You need to disable VRR for the best performance, but that's pretty disappointing if you want to use it for PC gaming. You can read more about it in detail with the full review on our website. If you game with PS5 or Xbox Series X, you'll be happy to know there aren't any compatibility issues with the TV. However, the response time problems with VRR still exist even with the consoles, so you'll need to disable VRR if you don't want this blurry mess. But the trade-off for that is that you might see some screen tearing. Oof, that was a lot just for gaming. The last thing we're going to look at is the speakers. Even though it has a dedicated subwoofer on the back, it doesn't produce much bass, and like most TVs, there isn't anything special about the speakers. It gets loud, and there aren't many artifacts of the max volume, which is good, but overall, its speakers aren't accurate. Like most TVs, you'll need a soundbar or a dedicated sound setup for the best experience. Now, this brings us to the main question. Should you buy this TV? I'll start by saying it's a great TV that should please most people, so you can't go wrong with it. It has deep and inky blacks for great performance in dark rooms, and it gets incredibly bright. It's one of the brightest TVs we've tested so far. It even has a bunch of gaming features, which is a nice touch. The downside is the bugs with its gaming performance though. The question of whether or not to buy it comes down to comparing it with other TVs and your budget. Again, you definitely can't go wrong with the TCL QM8 for watching shows and movies, but its issues make it hard to recommend for PC gaming. You can get a more polished TV at a higher cost, or better value at a lower price, so it's in a weird spot in the middle of the TV market. Compared to the high-end Samsung QN90C, the TCL is cheaper, gets brighter in HDR, supports Dolby Vision, and has a higher max refresh rate. However, the Samsung TV has better processing, like improved upscaling and EOTF tracking, 
so content looks closer to what the creator intended. You might find some of those trade-offs worth it if you don't mind spending a few hundred dollars more. Against the models from other budget brands, it doesn't exactly stand out. The older Hisense U8H costs less and has better processing, like with its upscaling. Sure, the TCL still gets a bit brighter and offers some higher refresh rates for gaming, but for performance against costs, the Hisense offers the best value. That's all for the TCL QM8. If you want to learn more, check out our written review on the website. The link is in the description below. Stay tuned for more TV reviews on our website, as we have a bunch of TVs in testing, including the Hisense U8K, which is the main competitor of this TV. Ciao. Thanks for staying to the end. You must love TVs just like us, or you just can't not finish a video. Either way, you're the exact person we're looking for. We've got positions open in our offices in Montreal. From tech-happy testers to word-happy writers, you can find the best jobs for your needs on our careers page.